Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson. Today, um, the night that I'm recording this is still September 11th in the U.S., which is a feast not only of the execution of John the Baptist, but also the commemoration of all Orthodox soldiers who've been killed in battle. My, um, I'm very proud to say that um, I was in D.C. at the time, of course, working for Willis Cardo, the Barnes Review, and the American Free Press. And um, I was the first to publish a dissident article on this phenomenon. So I wrote it that very night, really that afternoon, because none of us were allowed to leave the city. Um, and since we had very little information, I think all I said at the time was, Osama bin Laden is, is incapable of this kind of action. The last thing he did was push out some dynamite on a raft to the USS Cole. He didn't graduate to this. Um, the amount of, of timing and, and, and resources and in a tightly controlled Middle Eastern environment that he would have to do, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it's not in his interest, certainly not in the, the Arab or, or Islamic interest at the time. Um, it, the only person who gained from that, or the only entity that gained from that, was Zionism in, in the U.S. Uh, it was a, a godsend to um, to the Pentagon. Israel invaded the very next day, both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And of course, most importantly, I mentioned at the time that um, the press had, I remember 15 minutes, other people say 20 minutes or a half hour, that they had already blamed Osama bin Laden at Within that, within either 15 minutes or a half hour after the, um, after the hit the news. It was very, very quick. And they never deviated from this. And they said it with such certainty that I knew it couldn't be true. Later on, of course, we find out that, um, Osama bin Laden didn't last much longer after that. His kidneys were in such bad shape. He was in dialysis in Pakistan on September 11, 2001, died a short time later. The story about SEAL Team 6 killing it, it's a, it's a hoax. That's why there's no body. It's laughable. They shot an unarmed man. That doesn't make sense. The guy would be a wealth of information. They shot him and no one ever saw a body and it was dumped over the side or, or the ashes were dumped over the side of a ship. It's a, it's a laughable story. Um, and that was pretty much my, my argument at the time. We, did, we knew very little. But I realized that... Um, that nothing made sense, even at that early date. I remember my eighth grade field trip was to the World Trade Center because, um, you know, I'm born and raised in New Jersey, just over the river. It was a short trip in to New York City. My, my um, brother-in-law worked, worked there. My roommate in college worked there. It's not a big deal. Um, and I distinctly remember the tour guide telling us that the, the steel used in the girders that constructed the World Trade Center, were not just your ordinary steel. These were very expensive, custom-made alloy that was far stronger than any steel. But the standards for a building that high were insanely expensive. And I forget all the details or what the alloy actually is, but it ain't just steel. It's beyond steel. Uh, a building of that height um, utilizes a very special alloy that is indestructible. In the building code in, in Manhattan and elsewhere, the Port Authority uh, demanded it. And it was extremely expensive, and the builders were, were complaining about it. Uh, it has to be custom made. So this isn't just steel girders being melted here. This is a uh, hundred times the strength of a steel girder. This is a coated alloy that is meant to stop anything. So I distinctly remember that, thinking that at the time, that very day the, the planes hit. Um... And of course, very few people that I knew took the Pentagon story seriously. At the time, all we knew was that something hit it. The hole there couldn't have been a plane. There was no records of any plane. I saw it right after uh, um, you know the news crews got there as quickly as possible. There was no plane. And um, of course, it hit the only part of the uh, complex that was un uninhabited, which is odd. And then, of course, the obvious thing that I mentioned in that very first day that I know that there's something, uh, I know that some of the, of the protocol for how to intercept the plane that goes off track for, for such a long period of time 
at Andrews Air Force Base, of course, there's um, wing after wing of these um, fighters that are designed and, and are there to be called up at the moment's notice to defend the capital. Um, I even had military men, uh, Fred Busing, who had just retired from the Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel, saying there were no fighters at, at Andrews. There were only transport planes. Uh, I caught this guy, Stolen Valor, many times before, or at least once before, and I said, that can't be true. Of course, I looked it up, and he he knew it was a lie, but he was telling people that anyway. So I knew something was wrong. Nothing made sense about it. And the Arabic world, the anti-Israel world, uh, lost big time, and, and, and we all know this. So that's there's not much else I can add. The official report on 9-11 has been debunked so many times in every conceivable way. And we'll say, I'll say one last thing, because it's all, it's all been done before, but we know by now, all these years later, that the people who accept the official story accept it not because of any kind of intellectual conviction. They know it doesn't make sense. They accept it because it would require them to change their life completely and radically if they were to accept that this is all a big lie. And in fact, it's a big lie that's not difficult to pull off. It's very easy to blame people that no one knows anything about. Uh, most people, including educated people, are very ignorant about this kind of thing. Johnson's Law is always active when it comes to these people. It's very convenient that even your average educated historian knew nothing about these people, except what they read in the paper. So pulling off a lie like this is not that hard. It was um, it was clumsy. Uh, but when you have you know media... And, and oh, oh I, one last thing. I, I distinctly remember... Max's wife and I at the time had just watched The Lone Gunman, the episode which came out in March of 2001. That that show was pulled, although I liked it very much. Uh, the Lone Gunman, a spinoff from The X-Files, where it was a plane taking off from Logan in Boston to hit the World Trade Center. That came out in August of that year. I'm sorry, a, a March of that year. And we had just watched that again on video. And I, I said, this can't be a coincidence. Later on, I found out that it's, you know, there were a lot of precursors to this. Um, and we could go on and on. But the most important thing at this point to know, the intellectual stuff has been done. They, those, those people have lost the debate over and over again. The reason that so many people accept it is because they have no choice. For them to accept our point of view is for them to turn their life upside down. Everything they believe about the world, about the state, has to be thrown out and they have to start over again. And of course, they have to admit but they've been duped for all this time. The truth is, and of my 30 years in this movement, I've learned one very important lesson, and that is ignorance is easy. Knowledge is martyrdom. But today, I want to talk about something vaguely connected to that, and something that I've been asked to do more than once, and that is the political thought of the Syrian Social Nationalist Party. Once in a while, Eurasianists and others, you see the Syrian uh, SSNP flag. I have one in my office. It was a it's a Syrian movement founded in Lebanon by a Greek Orthodox man, Antum Sadeh, who and this is you know this is very much an Orthodox movement. Syria at the time was about um, this is in the 1920s, about 30 35 percent Greek or at least Greek Orthodox. They were the elites. Uh, that a tendency to be more urban. And they saw Islamic movements, of course, as a threat. And you know, your secular Muslims and your, your Christians have been the, the foundation of both the SSNP and the allied Ba'ath Party. Um, it is uh, openly a national socialist party. There's no question. But the political theory of the founder... And Tunsuda is really what what um, what this is all about. This man was a Greek Orthodox revolutionary. Um, he's known for his pretty radical secularism, but this is really more about the loathing of any any kind of Islamic fundamentalist state. Those are always well armed, often by the West, and are the threat to any kind of real Arabic nationalism. And Arabic nationalism could bring in both uh, Muslim and, and Greek Orthodox in what amounted to a 
um, anti-colonialist national socialist movement. Sadeh himself uh, was active for the most part in Lebanon, very artificially cut off from, from Syria. The big foundation of the party, of course, is that the French colonial administration and the English carved up the Middle East in no rational way. It's even worse than Africa. Syria is a, a fraction of what it truly should have been had things uh, developed normally. The one thing that imperialism is, is abnormal. It's common, doesn't make it normal. Um, Saddam had been operating in Lebanon. He thought that he was under the protection of the Syrian president at the time, Husni al-Zaim, who actually turned him over when he got back to Syria from uh, to the Lebanese. He was vehemently uh, anti-Zionist, anti-colonialist, and actually, as it turns out, his execution by firing squad took less than 48 hours from his arrest, arraignment, trial, execution. Less than 48 hours. It is an armed group. It has over 100,000 members. I'm not entirely sure how many of those are armed. But they have been fighting alongside the Ba'ath Party and the Syrian government against the Western-sponsored um, the ISIS charade and, and, and the other Islamic groups. And I mentioned this before, I need to mention it again, that the U.S. is firmly allied with al-Qaeda. To the extent that that, ex- that thing exists at all, the U.S. now is financing them. So they could not possibly have been uh, behind on 11 because, you know, uh, there's no way that they could now be allied with them today. There was no connection, and that's why it's palatable. Our enemies could read this in the paper and say the U.S. is financing this group, and it makes no impact on them. I don't envy them at all. So um, it was founded in 1932 uh, against French imperialism. And it remained a militant National Socialist Party uh, right up to the present day. And, and the fact that it's 1932 it was founded is not an accident. While this is a firmly nationalist party, it was, you know, Hitler was, no question, a... a, uh, a um, an early influence, especially since, you know, the, the, the vehemence that Hitler spoke of France at the time, early on in his career, the Syrians loved to hear things like that. Um, and more recently, it was an active part of the resistance to the uh, Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, um, and assisted in driving them out in 2000. Uh, unfortunately, the Ba'ath Party um, did take action against the SSNP as a threat to them. It's an error. The big difference between the two, the Ba'ath Party is pan-Arab. The SSNP is not. It is a Syrian party. Uh, and that, cha- that, that has quite a bit of impact on foreign policy. Remember, there was a united Arab state um, between Libya and Syria for a very short time, it didn't work out. But there is an attempt by the Ba'ath Party, both in Iraq and in Syria, to unify the Arab world. But since those two parties were at each other's throats most of the time, the SSNP was, of course, proven correct. There isn't the, the groundwork for an Arab movement, a pan-Arab movement. It's a theory only. Now, it had been active and armed in Syria, but it was only legalized in 2005, and immediately joined the Ba'ath Party, the so-called National Progressive Front. And then um, from 2012 to 2014, as many know, it was part of the Popular Front for the Liberation, both in Lebanon and in, and in Syria. I've heard that their military wing, the Eagles of the Cyclone, it's called sometimes the Eagles of the Whirlwind, um, they have about 12,000 veterans. Most of them, you know, they have the draft there, so mostly army guys. Uh, fighting in the field um, alongside the, the Ba'ath Party forces. Now, there, the nationalism of, of Seda is extremely well developed. When you read the literature on this, like everything in nationalism in English, it's a disaster. It's a disaster largely because they're very hostile to any kind of anything that says social nationalists, they're going to react vehemently to. They have no choice. 
And furthermore, scholars of nationalism usually know nothing about nationalism. Since they're so deeply alienated from their own people, they're so deeply alienated from any sense of, of the nation at all, they can't put themselves in a position of those who they're trying to study. They deliberately, I think, confuse nation and state. Um, they refer to ethnic groups and nations as if they're two different things. Then you press them, and you press them, and they, they'll say that what they really mean state, not nation. They don't know what they're talking about. And it's, it's extremely difficult to even read the English language literature on this man. Um, their belief is for a, what we call a greater fury. And a greater fury is really nothing that interesting except it's to redraw the map the way it should have been before the colonial rulers changed it. Um, they're not pan-Arab. They're not pan-Islamic. And it makes them unique in that respect. That makes them different from the Ba'ath Party. The Syrian nation is a, is a cultural body, a social economic body. It's a mixed body, but over the centuries has become quite a unified one. They speak one language and, generally speaking, are of one culture, even between the two religions. And they come right out and say that the Syrian people, centuries ago, is a mixture of races generated by migrations and intermarriages. It's a slogan that they've used many times before. Well, that's not really interesting. That's kind of like saying you can't really be an individual if you take influences from other people. Well, that's ridiculous. Everyone is influenced by other people. That's It's unthinkable that you couldn't be. So, of course, a race, nation, ethnic group are, are from intermarriages of, of closely related peoples. They're not strangers to one another. You don't marry somebody who doesn't speak your language. These are people who've been thrown together by circumstance, but also because they have a foundation that they could work on. There's a connection there in terms of language and everything else. So, yeah, you know, migrations into marriage, well, these aren't strangers to one another. Just like an individual can be influenced by many other individuals and still remain a person, a nation can be based on this mixture of things as well. Everything is. That's not an interesting point. Um, the SSNP fought with every, every ounce of its being. Any kind of separatism, especially on an Islamic basis, the secularism of this movement is strong, but when you understand what they're fighting against, it's understandable. Um, Sadeh refers to the Wahhabist uh, ideology financed by the West. He calls it a return to the desert. This is a, an ideology of, of, the, of the Arabian tribes. They completely reject any connection between that kind of Islam and civilization. But the left rewrites history it finds inconvenient. There's a book out called Antun Sudeh, The Man, His Thought, an Anthology. Adal Bashra um, butchers this guy. It paints him as a liberal democrat. You see, when the left comes across a first-rate thinker that is threatened by, they do one of two things. Either they marginalize him, so no one's ever heard of him, or they try to make him one of their own. And that's what this Bashara does here. It's called an anthology, but it contains not a single work by Sadeh, which is suspicious. There's very good reason for that. The other great foundation of the SSNP is this hostility to Zionism and Judaism. They saw Jews, not really a nation, not really a race, not, certainly not a religion, but they saw them as a den of thieves, unwilling to assimilate. They are fanatical nationalists far beyond anything that the Arab world can come up with. Um, Jews don't constitute a nation in their mind because they're such a heterogeneous mixture of people. They're Khazar, they're Middle Eastern, they're Central Asian. They're all over the place. This is not a, a, a foundation for a nation at all. But part of what he says makes Syria Syria is that it has been able to assimilate newcomers that are similar to itself. It's essential to its progress. This is what Syria partially is over the centuries. It's remained itself while absorbing many people from the outside. It doesn't like talking in terms of race, because the Middle East is such a chaotic uh, uh, cauldron 
that many different related peoples in a similar civilization have come together to create Syria over the millennium. But that's, again, also an interesting because everybody's like that. Every individual's like that. Every family's like that. It's a common attack on nationalism that, well, we're all mixed people. And so, well, that doesn't mean they're not a unified people. They're speaking a, a, the same language. They generally speaking have the same customs. Or if they don't, that you can't have a civic life. If you don't know how to talk to one another. So, so this says that Syrians were some of the first people to ever move into the civilizational phase. This original transition gave Syria uh, a leg up many millennia ago. But that transition now is facing another one, not as a transition to modernity. Modernity doesn't mean what the Enlightenment said it was, because it's very different how something like that can be absorbed in a place like Syria versus France. They reject any kind of clerical... Now, of course, there's no clergy in Islam. But to create an Islamic state would be to remove many Greek Orthodox who really are the backbone of the economy. And of course, an Orthodox state is absurd when you're only 20% of the population. The separation of mosque and state is absolutely essential for him. There is no way that... Um, Anything could, could come together in Syria without that. But they also have a concept of the Renaissance. Their own Renaissance. They really hate the old regime because it's connected to dependency, dependency on colonialism, and the old landowning clans. Now, one of the great victories of Hafez al-Assad, that his son Bashar has uh, inherited. Back in 1991, I wrote the first paper of anybody on our side, uh, talking about Assad as, as our ally. And part of my argument was that he had smashed the old landowning class. And in so doing, he was able to distribute land to those who actually till it. And to this very day, Syria is a land of smallholders. This is why the Ba'ath Party is very popular. The SSNP has many, many members, even as it's been illegal for a long time. And the reasoning for that is is something that's escaped me. They're natural ally. And they certainly are today. The minute they were legalized, they joined with the Ba'ath Party in fighting this the Western backed uh, uh, civil war that they've created. He stressed those things that we kind of consider modern in the sense of a strong intellectual class, access to education, and the judicious use of science. Now again, there's no difference between that and the Middle Ages. But the Middle East, that's another story. He's talking about modernity. He's talking about breaking through the ancient regime, which is the French system, and the oligarchy that it left behind. And the dictator who murdered him was part of that ancient regime. The Renaissance in Syria is a spiritual, intellectual, patriotic movement. Um, and a lot of it is to be found what you find in Assad today, both Assad. The destruction of that ruling class, so-called feudalism, which is a sloppy term, but you know what you, they mean. The old dependent class, which is part of the old colonial inheritance. So revolution is absolutely essential, and it's already been done. The reason that Syria and much of the third world at the time was in such a bad state is in the 19... Uh, um, it's, you know, the... the it's called the communique, the first social nationalist revolution of 1949. It's a, it's a, it's a brief, um, a brief letter, but it says that it's this oligarchy. It's not aristocracy. It's, it's an oligarchy that has brought Syria to its, what we would call today a third world status. So in smashing the old landowning class, they're not going to give it over to capitalists. So fighting the capitalist, uh, uh, oligarchy, which is just as nasty, in fact, worse than the, than the feudal one, are the two pillars, the negative pillars of this, of this movement. You know, mandatory education, modern healthcare, nationalization of much of the economy, especially, uh, uh, raw materials. And of course, as always, looking to the great success stories like, you know, South Korea. Now, this is prior to, to the South Korean, um, uh, victory, but, but not that much prior. And of course, they're violently anti-communist. 
um, in fighting the Israelis in Lebanon, they did join a handful of very fragile coalitions that included the Communist Party because they were militant, also very anti-Israeli. They included some Jews from Europe and Israel, which was very useful to them. And that became what we call the Lebanese National Resistance Front. And within that was also the PLO. Uh, and so some have said, and, and I agree, that, that a national syndicalism, if you were to ask from my particular economic point of view, that's what, that's what it would be. Um, and others have also pointed to the fact that the Liberation War, if you've read uh, George Sorrell, you'll see the same concept of the general strike there. The party exists really as an army with an ideology. Military operations, guerrilla operations, assassinations. I mean, the, the dictator that, that killed Sadeh was, was, was assassinated by the SSNP not too long afterwards. Sacrifice and the understanding that death is a part of life and is not to be feared is essential. In fact, one of the, the programmatic quotes from Sadeh is, we love life because we love freedom and we love death. When death is a pass, path to life. It is a violent movement. Which makes perfect sense. Because it's a violent area. Their enemies over and over again they say. Uh, French colonialism. The, the oligarchy. Zionists. Politicians in general. The Lebanese Catholic separatism. Separatists. The Islamic separatists. The fundamentalists in Syria. And of course the communists. 1949. It was part of a revolutionary movement against the Lebanese government. And this one was smashed, led to the execution of Sadeh on the 8th of July. Um, and the units that were involved in this uh, violence committed suicide before they would surrender. Um, in fact, it's a common story for people who study this. One of the, one of the fighters um, attempted to kill himself, failed, woke up in a hospital, and killed himself with his own hands, tearing open his wounds in the hospital, and finished her job. Um, remember, the invasion of Lebanon in 1982 was at the invitation of the Zionist uh, President Bashir Gamayou. He asked the Israelis to invade Lebanon all the way up to Beirut. One of the reasons that the SSNP took the armed stance it did in, in our era, is because of this. So many of these, uh, the Catholics and, and other, other Christian groups in Lebanon are, are pro, are pro Israel. To some extent, they're pro Israel for the same reason that the SSNP is pro, uh, a pro strong, pro Assad, pro secularism. It's to keep the Muslims at bay. Apparently, they don't really, you know, after something like the, uh, the, the massacres of, of, um, Ariel Sharon, the attack on the, on the Liberty, Lebanese Christians should, should have gotten the message. These are not your friends. But many of the upper classes, uh, the Christian upper classes in Lebanon are still essentially French. Um, but, you know, Sudan rejects, there, there's people who try to make a liberal out of him by saying he rejects racialism. But listen, listen to what he says here. We must clear out from our thought the concept of a physical unity in the nation. Most sociologists agree that racial unity is an illusion and scientifically unacceptable. The nation is not a physical or a blood unit, but a rational historical one. A deep chasm separates lineage from nation. Lineage is a general physical entity, while a nation is a general mental and rational fate. Race is a natural prehistoric fact, but the nation, on the other hand, is something that develops across time. It's part of human thought, emotion, and will. Now, a Western liberal will use a quote like that and say, you see, he's, he's a cosmopolitan. It's a stupid thing to say. That's a far cry from rejecting racialism. He simply states that race by itself can't be the foundation for a nation or anything for that matter because no material reality can be the basis for things. What reason works on is the other matter. If race is prehistoric and also natural, as he says, then it's a good thing and a part of human nature. What we do with that is another matter. So to take and, and you know, not understanding the context, not understanding the mentality behind his, his, 
you know, a, a modern scholar will read this and read it as if, you know, there's some liberal 2018. And this is what, you know, bad historians do, which is unfortunately most of, most of the academy. Um, in the journal New Syria in 1940, um, the SSNP says this. Every war that erupts must have two weapons, moral and material. It's the main force in the movement of the Syrian Nationalist Party, a spiritual force. The type of war, this initial stage, must be spiritual. War has so far been limited to moral weapons. In this war, the SSNP represents the attacking force and is a nationalist weapon, which was born and disseminated in the Syrian people and raised its spiritual capacity to a very high degree. With this weapon, the SSNP has become a great force to be feared to do when it starts using physical weapons. The enemies of the Syrian nation, both foreign and domestic, represent the defending force and their foreign non-nationalist weapons. The concept of war, whether it be intellectual or physical, is essential to this party. Political parties develop, at least in this case, develop their cohesion through violence and warfare. It's not a bad thing. It separates the men from the boys. Um, the core here, and it's very important to understand, like any nationalist group, is rejection of individualism. No one could be a nationalist or a socialist or anything in between by accepting individualism. The great victory of the SSNP ideologically, and Andrew Sadez thought, is that you can't divide social life uh, into civic, economic, religious areas. These spheres are not to be taken seriously. They're not real. They're only, they're only in the academy. Individualism is a weapon of the bourgeoisie, who they despise more than any other group of people, except maybe the Zionists. Now, 1923, Sadat um, did a lecture broadcast called Freedom and Its Causes. And it's used by some um, writers on this subject to make believe that he was in favor of the French Revolution. If you read this quickly, you think that he is. You start to wonder, maybe this is just a civic nationalist modernist group. It's not the case. He believes that the initial impetus was to destroy the old aristocracy. But then he says the only result was to exterminate the clearest and most honorable blood of France. Now I'm quoting him here. The aristocracy that emerged after the extermination of those aristocrats in the democratic republics left them with the most cruel system. Looking at its results abroad, we found that they did not achieve any aspiration that they held. The revolution annihilated by the democrats and aristocrats took power from the people who brought the sacrifices and ambition to everything that is honorable and great by virtue of what they inquire, of what they acquire from the environment. In other words, the new elites were far worse than the old. Nothing changed. Sadat holds to a physical concept of race because he says the French were predisposed to that kind of life at the time. You could change the form of government, but you don't change the people that way. The monarchy was not a bad thing when you compare it to the oligarchy that followed. But he says the French were at the time inherently uh, predisposed to tyranny. So the move from aristocracy to oligarchy was not just uh, not a good thing, but it was an awful thing. He says that democracy really, in the liberal sense, is just choosing one's masters. Then he said, in the very same broadcast, he says, in England, and he's talking about the 18th century, of course, the aristocracy is far superior to the democratic forms of government. He says they're more civic-minded, than the Republicans and more faithful in their service. There has to be a close trust between the nation and the people, but that can I notice are two different things. But then there's a union with the elites, with the ruling class, there's a strong leadership principle in the SSNP. The English aristocracy, he says, you know, has a strong elitism, which any good aristocrat does. But the French revolutionary idea is pure oligarchy. It is the worst kind of state. It's the worst kind of tyranny. So, once in a while you come across a writer that says, oh, the SSNP, this is not National Socialist. They're 
Sade is a is a um, was a Democrat and a cosmopolitan. In fact, there's a book that says that openly. But then Sade says this. In fact, the origin of true aristocracy and true freedom dates back to pre-American and pre-French revolutionaries in time. These are all Christian principles. And anyone who reads the New Testament uh, in the Bible finds them manifest in many of the eternal philosophical statements made by the High Nazarene. So the French Revolution was a failure because it exaggerated the tyranny of the monarchy, which really wasn't there, and of course established a new elite that was far worse than the old. It was all negative. They say the same thing about the liberals and the communists. They speak in negative terms, which is very suspicious because they need to say, we don't like the system, well, what's going to follow it? Making matters worse, the French revolutionary oligarchy created the colonial empire that was soon to take Syria. Apparently, the rights of men didn't apply to Syrians. Then he says, I believe the French Revolution was the greatest act of tyranny in history and the most deceitful act of the world today because it and the resulting wars and other massacres in the world didn't give the world freedom, brotherhood, and equality, but it destroyed the best men of France and destroyed its moral core. The nation is a center of civilization. It's essential to human psychology. It is a biological entity, no different than, than a family is. You can't base it on biology, but it's certainly present. A homeland is something that needs to represent feelings, emotions. And he comes right out and says, blood in psychological times. He makes a distinction between nomadic tribes, which of course, you know, the Bedouins in, in the Arab world are, are well known. That's not civilization. The nation and civilization are one and the same. He talks about early on the, the oligarchy and how journalists and academics do nothing but flatter them. He says that wealth in and of itself is neutral, which is something that I personally reject, but I understand this point of view. Justice could be brought about by a few rich guys who are willing to spend their money for a good cause. But as we all know, the left is far more liberal with its uh, multi-billionaires than uh, the conservatives are, the right-wingers are. Some of them actually do produce things. But the problem is, is that oligarchy leads to an academic environment, a journalistic environment of nothing but flattery. Now, the SSNP, as it's developed, became known um, for a few very basic principles. And number one foundational thing, the Syrian nation, or any nation, is essential for any civic life whatsoever. And as I've said before, he says if the Syrian nation didn't exist, then there would be no anti-colonial movement. Now, as part of this principle, he does separate the idea of the nation as the ethnic group and the people. They're not the same thing. Now, he talks about the nation as a political entity. He is referring to civic term, but that's perfectly okay. He says when you talk about the nation, politically speaking, it is a public matter. The word republic, although it actually means something different, republic comes from respublica in, in Latin, the public object, the public thing. That means that anything private is illegitimate. Now, we know in reality, uh, the modern republics are oligarchies. That's where they come from. That's what their purpose is, to divide the spoils once the king is dead. Um, it's the foundation of modernity in Europe. But any nationalist worth anything will say the whole point of this. But the nation provides a foundation linguistically and racially in such a way that you're not strangers anymore. You're part of one extended family. Well, certainly you're mixed over the centuries. Who cares? Every individual is that way. They're still people. But it's public. Parties, in the modern sense, and factions, usually based either on religion or, or money in Syria at the time, they take what is public and make it private. You know, today, the West, the state's a private domain as all republics are. This is one of the reasons that, and, and Sade is aware of this, even in the 30s and 40s, um, 
which is why to say that the state is actually a public entity is a revolutionary act. Because in an oligarchy, which most, most governments are today, and back then, um, an oligarchy will take the levers of government and power, political power, and act as if they're serving the public good. They can't say otherwise. They have to hide themselves. But in fact, it's purely a matter of profit. We've spoken on the show of Lev Gumilev, who centered his idea in the genesis of the nation in the constant dialectical back and forth between a group of people and its environment. When I say environment, I'm talking about the, the weather, the, the location, the natural resources, the neighbors, is it close to water, this kind of thing. Gumilev's point of view was that nations take the forms that they do at a foundational level depending on how many variables in the environment are problems that have to be overcome. That would include, you know, foreign bodies as well as the physical environment. This is where nations come from. It's very hard to deny. It's, 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 it's the truth of nature. And everything that a nation is comes from that foundation. Because it's a public entity, the Syrian nation is one society. It's really the same thing said from two different points of view. You can't have these differences in religion or class. Those were the big two in, in Syria at the time. And then claim you have the same nation. The lack of social unity negates the public interest, he would say. Either the government is a public entity, which means it's a national entity, or it's privatized. And when we say privatized, we mean it's simply the plaything of the strongest faction, the richest faction, the most devious faction. He talks about syndicalism in an indirect way, because he's talking about the nation's the foundation for all kinds of cooperation. The more fragmented a society is, the easier it is for foreigners to exploit. This is why global capital wants liberal democracies. They don't want chaos, of course. But the last thing they want is a strong state. The first thing is the IMF will demand, really most, you know, IMF is just a consortium of private banks, for the bankers of the world demand a weak state. They want lots of parties, except nationalist parties, which are usually, usually banned. They want lots of parties, because the more divisions, the weaker the parties, the weaker the state, the easier it is for capital to simply take over. Not to be blatant about it, but to use the forms of the state for their own purposes. Now, of course, we're talking about the great divider, the great destroyer, which in the SSMP is the Jew. It is the inversion of the good. There was a speech in uh, 2018, by the Ministry of Culture and the SSNP, that says um, that the Jew operates through stealth, rarely revealing himself. Now, the issues that they create, we see it in America today, people don't care about. They talk about press control to declare what the people don't want to declare. Not to declare the will of the people, but to declare the will of the alien imposed on the people. In other words, to convince the Goyim that their ideas are in fact their own. The difference is, a unified national society is one without the Jewish spirit. You don't have to be a Jew to take and take part of the Jewish spirit, but that's its origin. It is a, a nation of destroyers. It is an inversion of the good. There was an article out published by um, Ilya Kuri, Dean of Culture and Fine Arts for the party. And he says, and he, he quotes Sadeh as saying, that the Jews are a dangerous mixture of beliefs and rigid foreign doctrines. And its objectives are in conflict with the reality of the Syrian nation and its rights and sovereignty. It and the Syrian ideal are fundamentally contradictory. It's a closed body of corrupt elites. What both Sudan and the SSNP today say, 
the Palestine issue isn't really the center. It's not a matter of Jews moving into Palestine and living there peacefully. No, the Jew cannot live among others. That's not how it works. That would be equality, and they don't believe in that. They must dominate and control everything around them. So it's not just a matter of, of you know, these Khazars coming in from Europe to, to control Palestine, or to live in Palestine and to create this Israel. But they just can't move in. They can't cooperate with anybody else. They must take over. And at the time, the, the um, movement for a greater Israel was much bigger than it is today. And much of Syria was in their sights. And you guess SNP may have thought that they were going to use French or British guns to do it. But Zionism was one of the things that really galvanized the SSNP in its early years. They were well aware of the Talmud. They knew exactly what they were talking about. As I said before, the distinction is between, on the one hand, a unified nation, on the other, one that has a Jewish spirit, which is one of fragmentation and inversion. And if they're not divisions, they'll create them. But more broadly, this unified nation is everything to him. The nation is a holistic entity. It's the only political point of view that talks about society as a holistic entity. It has to be. You can't have civic life without a common language, very close commonalities and morality at the fundamental level. Thoughts about the past, thoughts about the future. This has to be shared in common, or you can't talk about politics at all. People just talk past each other. Of course, nations are, are racial, but they're not only that. He talks about a self that's a, a social body. So the mind, intuition, practically the existential, all of these come from the experience within the nation. Because the, the individual, the family, the locality are nothing without the nation. They couldn't defend themselves. They can't function on their own. As Hegel would say, once society begins to develop a, a division of labor, they have to ask themselves, well, what is the purpose of this division of labor? They begin to team themselves as a unity, broken up into different parts with different functions, different specialties. This whole world, and that of all national socialism, and all nationalism, is the refutation of individualism. Man was a totality of himself. And of course, because he comes from the connection with his surroundings, he's one with the world around him. The topography, the environment, as much a part of you and me as, as, as the language and the ideas we have. Idea of solidarity. So the common features of the landscape, you know, as well as what comes from it, the interactions uh, of the people with it creating you know, language and culture. And an individual, a, a universal doctrine like Christianity won't be vitiated by this, but how it's manifested will definitely be different. On the other hand, he didn't see Islam being like this. He certainly didn't see Judaism as being like this. It destroys what it touches. He was frightened to death of what would happen to Syria if the fundamentalists took over. Not just because he was Orthodox, but also because he was a Syrian patriot. The idea of solidarity is something like the Slavic subordinost. That the individual and community are not mutually exclusive. They depend on each other. They're two aspects of the same social essence. His view of nationalism is regionalist. Because your trading partners, your friends, your enemies are going to be those closer to you. He did not believe in environmental determinism. But this dialectical back and forth between the man, the society on the one hand, and the surrounding environment on the other, allows for freedom, allows for choice. Um, it's a dynamic theory. It's a civilizing theory. And it's the only way that you can grow internationalism is in fact interaction among nations. Internationalism and cosmopolitanism are two, two very different things. The interaction among nations does nothing more than solidify those independent units. Um, you know, the horizontal form of interaction, which determines the extent and character of regional interaction, and vertically between man and the land. 
Now, of course, Marxism reduces everything to the clans and wants to reduce nationalism to the bourgeoisie, which makes no historical sense. But there, the economic is sunk into a broader world. Mind is the human factor in progress. The nation is shaped by geography. This is the creation of ethnic origins. It's not in opposition to ethnic origins. Um, leadership derives from this precisely. He said, for anyone to, to lead the national socialist state here, and you see how this, this is, is in such distinctions everywhere else. First, it's necessary that these people view the state as a public entity, never private affairs. That's the distinction between an illegitimate and legitimate government. Two, the parliament has to support, has to be supported by the population. Not necessarily of the will of the population, but the will of the nation. Any outside pressure is illegitimate. Third, basic knowledge, which you don't have in, in Western politics. They have to be experts in different fields. They have to be transparent. Their policies have to be clear. And the origins of the policies have to be clear. Sectarianism is out of the question, especially in, in the Islamic world. But any kind of interaction, the only, only kind of democracy that he'll accept is one that revolves around programs, not people. Let's revolve around ideas. This is what leadership comes down to on a very practical level. So he says in his very famous book, The Genesis of Nations, he writes this. The principle, one nation, one society, is the basis of genuine national unity, the mark of national consciousness, and the guarantee of the life and endurance of the Syrian character. Unity of society is the basis of the community of interests, and consequently the basis of community life. The absence of social unity entails the absence of common interests, and no resort temporary expediency can make up for that loss. Through social unity, the conflict of loyalties and negative attitudes will disappear and be replaced by a single healthy national loyalty ensuring the revival of the nation. All religious bigotry and the nefarious consequences will cease, and in their stead, national collaboration and toleration will prevail. He notices, like any good historian, that it's rare that a, a, a nation comes into existence with more than one religion. Well, in Syria, he has no choice. Those two religions aren't going anywhere. He loves his own, there's no doubt about it. But he's in Syria, he's a minority. In Lebanon, he's a minority. Even among Christians, he's a minority in Lebanon. That means ethnicity has to dominate them both. Either ethnicity dominates them both, or they'll destroy each other. The goal of nation building doesn't depend on a, on a single factor. And I don't know of anybody, any, any decent nationalist who holds this. His race and language are connected. Race and religion are connected. All of these are social. He was utterly meticulous about this. He was talking about sociological facts. He doesn't reduce it to anything, but we understand that the interaction between man and the environment create the nation, create the ethnic group, and in fact create the very foundation of the race. He has a notion of the community of life. This is a cycle of the socioeconomic. It's an integrationist process. It's not an accumulation of elements. He says social conscience and community life, that is one life based on a socioeconomic cycle, including the whole community and stimulating national consciousness. This is identical to Hegel's view. Interaction of the disparate parts of a people creates the nation. You have a division of labor, but what's the unity of which they're a part? Capitalism never answers this because it can't go beyond two. The third thing for him was the nation. There was no way to destroy colonialism unless that's the case. If the two religions are going to fight it out, the foreign powers can use one against another. Therefore, they had to take, if independence was ever going to happen, they had to take a second place to the nation. Nations don't work with more than one religion. This is why the SSNP is so radical. That's why it's so um, vehement. That's why it's so violent. That has to be crushed if there's ever a chance of any kind of, of nationalism. And this is exactly what the Ba'ath Party has done. It works. He looks at the Bedouins. 
and they take a superficial view of the, the relationship with the land because they're always moving. It's like someone who, who moves to a different house every year in a different part of the country. What personality will that create? It's a fractional nomadic mind. It has no connection to anything. But this is the prehistory of the Arabic world. This is, in fact, what the Jew is. The Jew has no home because it's certainly not a Middle Eastern phenomenon. Even Khazaria, you know, that's, that's the origin of the bulk of Jews, but there's no devotion to it. The point is, the elements that make up an individual are the same thing that make up the nation. An individual remains a person precisely because it's facing a mix of influences, of ideas, of problems, of challenges. That's what creates anything. That's what creates the nation and therefore civic life comes from these experiences. He anchored nationalism on sociology. The nation is a product of interaction cycle. It fuses all social, ethnic, tribal, and sectarian elements into one life and one destiny within a specific territory. This is the ethnos. This is racial, but it's a lot else besides. It rejects Marxism. It advocates social struggle, not class struggle. The class against which Marxism declares war is not the only one that social nationalism fights. There are other social categories that escape the historical materialist approach, but are observed elsewhere. These entities derive their power uh, from a foundation but that might not be economic. So national socialism in Syria is comprehensive. Uh, now, it's true that, that um, they do converge when they talk about imperialism, but they refuse that the national socialists in Syria will not stop at just dealing with economics. If imperialism is an extension of capitalism, and in fact it's always been capitalism, it applies to capitalist imperialism only, but there are other kinds of, of aggression. Nationalism is a comprehensive social theory. Um, the descriptive elements, normative elements, these are balanced. Liberation for a society like that, for a, for a geographical entity like Syria, has to be more than merely economic. The emergence of nations, or I should say like modern nation states, come from two elements. The historical, perennial, perennial existence of ethnic groups, with its identity, each in its language of its own, but then there is a subjective awareness of this identity that comes through interaction. States, not ethnic groups as such, make their appearance in Europe with the rise of capitalism. Now, you're talking about a civic nationalism created by secularism and and so-called democratic or oligarchic institutions. They pave the way, of course, for pure aristocracy of money. Capitalism in the West All the divisions and imbalances impeded nationalism. It is inherently internationalist. It wasn't possible for nationalism in the West to exclude capitalism in the way that excluded feudalism. Capitalism was necessitated by all the tremendous strides in scientific and technology, the same factors that created the state. But when you go to a place like Syria, and the writings of Sudan and the SSNP, Nationalism is far more comprehensive. They are the victims of capitalism, not its creators. It's created under imperialism. It provokes the idea of the nation because imperialism is just one nation subjugated under another, or really under a cosmopolitan elite. Nationalism advances in a third world country like Syria under conditions of instability and revolutionary upheaval. Society is torn between the national and the ethnic over and against the dependent capitalist classes and the old landowners. The national makes its appearance within a society that lacks any real awareness of its national identity in the third world. It's created in a society dominated by dependent elites, those who require colonialism to function. So the, under these conditions, there is no way a capitalist can, can align itself with the newly emerging uh, nationalist forces. Of course, they're, they're motivated by narrow interests. They can't turn their back on the colonial uh, entities that finance them. Capitalism in a country like Syria has to ally uh, align itself with um, so-called progressivism, 
become a part of international capitalism. So as a matter of objective fact, newly emerging forces of nationalism within such a society cannot but perceive capitalism as a basic impediment in the exact same way that they view feudalism or sectarianism. So, a national socialist is, of course, a socialist. But Sadat, so national socialism in general, reject Marxism. Um, because what they look at um, is what, what exactly is it that they're liberating? The present state of fragmentation and national division isn't because of the economic system, it's because of external domination. These are unnatural conditions. They lack an awareness of national identity and common interests. Imperialist powers have forces on them. The communist approach focuses on class struggle, allegedly, and creates a class consciousness, which is really nothing more than Jewish intellectuals. But they add a new decisive, uh, or actually divisive factor in the third world. But the root cause is foreign domination. The revolution is to create a totally free society, free from exploitation, and fully confident in itself. Nationalism can mobilize the ethnos in this way, but Marx can't. He's purely negative. Without the nation, without such clarity as their identity, there can be no clarity among people of what constitutes their interests. Social liberation has to aim at those ends in whose fulfillment the interests of society as a whole are maintained. But that requires an ethnic identity. In the communist world, the nation is destroyed. This is why national socialism in the third world can never connect itself to, to communism. To a great extent, people like Castro and Ho Chi Minh may have developed this way had the U.S. not attacked it. Even though the ruling class was certainly opposed to attacking it. Nationalism, not class consciousness, is a proper agency for transforming Syrian society. This is the crux of his social nationalism. Rejecting the nation, they can't point to anything to be liberated. And of course, they vehemently oppose, and he vehemently opposes, any kind of internationalism. Well, I'm at one hour now. I didn't get a chance to finish what I wanted to do. There's so much here. Um, what distinguishes social nationalism, and they, they come right here, they call themselves national socialists to this very day. It is the building of a firmly unified state-centric ethnic group that can overcome the divisions of society that are used by imperial powers to destroy them. That's the Jewish way, that's the capitalist way, that's the communist way. And this is why nationalism is such a threat. Thank you everyone for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Goodbye.